Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Love Grove on Health. My name is Dominic Lukes, Marketing Manager, and joining me as always is the star of the show, Andrew Lovegrove, Senior Consultant at Skills for Health. How are things with you, Andrew? Hi, Dom. Really good to be back here again, and uh, it's great to be doing another uh, episode of Love Grove on Health. And I think if I'm right, we'll be launching this episode following the launch of the podcast to celebrate the NHS 75th anniversary and really great opportunity for us to celebrate and to commemorate an important milestone in the NHS and you know so many people with stories about the impact the NHS has had on their lives and from a patient perspective but also from the people who work day in and day out in the NHS. It was a really great opportunity to do that podcast. And I think I'm really looking forward to today's podcast because I think we are going to be talking about something that isn't always front and centre in people's mind. And I think this podcast holds the record of the most people we've had uh, join us, special guest stars. I think we've got three people joining us today. So my main uh, hope and expectation is that I get everyone's name right and I don't get horribly muddled up during our conversation. Uh, But I'm looking forward to today and I'm going to ask the same question of you, uh, Don. How are things with you? Well, thank you for asking. Not too bad. Nothing too exciting that's been happening in my life, to be honest with you. Although I am off to see the Open on Friday up at your neck of the woods in in, in Merseyside. So looking forward to a day off and watching some high quality golf action. But you're right to say we are maxed out our virtual studio today. And it's it's great that, you know, this little podcast that we started off 18 months or so ago is growing and it's proven to be so popular and a hit with everybody. So brilliant. So, yeah, we've got more podcasts planned to support future uh, frameworks that we're working on at the moment, but also to look at some of the, the big news that's been hit in the sector recently as well. So stay tuned. Thanks, Dom. So I'm really looking forward to today's uh, edition of Love Grove on Health because we're going to be shining a light on uh, an area of care, an area of practice that perhaps doesn't always get the front headlines that it deserves and uh, an area that perhaps some of, of our own listeners are not that uh, familiar with. Today's podcast, we are going to be looking at the recently launched career and competence framework for uh, non-custodial uh, settings. And I'm really interested in this area because it's quite topical at the moment, as happened in London. Um, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner has recently made some announcements about their organisation's response to mental health crises and the health sector's response to that. And we need to shine a light on how health and justice are aligned. So today feels quite timely to be talking about health and justice and really to promote the framework that's been recently launched as a vehicle to promote careers, opportunities for members of the workforce to perhaps think about working in this area, for it to be a bit of a launch pad for people who've never considered working in this area or even within healthcare. So quite uh, an, an innovative work, but also hoping to shine a light on something that wouldn't always get talked about to the way um, that it should be. So as well as that being the extra special element, we are joined today by not one, not two, but three special guest stars. I think this is the most we've had on one podcast. So uh, I'm going to ask my friends and colleagues to introduce themselves now. So Rosemary, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, Andrew, and uh, delighted to be part of this podcast. As you said, it's it's, it's particularly timely and a a great example of um, shining a light on on this particular area and talking about 
the work that we've done to develop the non-custodial career and competence framework. So my name is Rosemary Simpson. I'm one of the senior consultants at Skills for Health. And together with other colleagues at Skills for Health and the NHS England Health and Justice team and subject matter experts, we've worked to facilitate the development of this new non-custodial career and competence framework. Thanks, Rosemary. Good to, good to get you on the podcast at last. So welcome. Michael, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Andrew. Uh, my name is Michael Blakey. I'm the team manager of the Liaison and Diversion Service up here in Northumbria. We'll cover the Northumbria area from the Scottish borders down to Sunderland and midway across the country. So, yeah. Fabulous. My geography isn't the best, but I can kind of just about imagine that a huge geographical uh, footprint. And uh, if I may say, your accent gives you away slightly. But I mean, I'm from a lovely part of the world, so it's great to have you with us. And it's great to have somebody who's there working at the coalface, uh, working with the front line. Uh, and we'll really look forward to uh, talking to you some more a little bit later. Smashing. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not not least, uh, Glyn. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Hi. Uh, Glyn Thomas. I work for NHS England's National Health and Justice team, where I lead on our non-custodial programmes of work. That's all the uh, health services we provide in criminal justice settings, save for prisons and immigration removal centres. Thank you, Glyn. So um, we've got somebody who's working with on a national level, very much supporting the deliverance of policy, helping to set those objectives. We've got somebody working at the front line and we've got my colleague Rosemary, who's a workforce development expert who helped to develop the framework that we're here to talk about today. So uh, a real rich tapestry of talent and experience. So. I have to confess, I'm really looking forward to today's podcast. So, Glyn, I I might come to you first. So we've talked about the fact that we've developed this career and competence non-custodial framework. But sort of going back to the beginning, why did you see uh, a need for such a framework to support the work that you and others are doing I think the origins to this stem with some work we did for Skills from Health a few years ago to develop a career and competency framework for liaison and diversion services. Uh, These are services that look to identify vulnerability uh, at the earliest point people come into contact with the criminal justice system and uh, to direct them into relevant health services and to share information with key decision makers in criminal justice agencies. And... We developed this in conjunction with Skills of Health, this, uh, this this framework, which was well received by our commissioners and our provider organisations across the country. And as time has progressed within the health and justice world at NHS England, we now deliver a wider range of services as we follow people's journey along the criminal justice system. From the moment they come into contact with the police, through the courts, uh, if they pass through the, the secure estate, And then we we assist in terms of our reconnect services on resettlement. So we wanted to provide that that sort of underpinning this pathway with a concept of continuity of care. We saw the uh, the overlap in the the, the blend of knowledge, skills and experience required to support this cohort of individuals along that whole path journey. That's great, Glenn. And I think, you know, you you, you touched there that, you know, that that, that whole journey um, is so important and that we, in some way, we, you know, we recognise that, that, you know, people pass through various stages on that journey and that they don't, or we certainly need to do all, our level best to prevent people from falling in between or down organisational or, or indeed uh, sectoral stools. So creating something that cuts across uh, those two sectors in the ways that you've just uh, alluded to and indeed others. I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's really important for the people who are using those services uh, who, who can benefit from those from those best, best outcomes, but also to create perhaps some collaboration and shared understanding of various parts we play if we come from either that traditional health and or justice sectors, the fact 
there's a lot of overlap and shared responsibility, shared decision making, shared working, to, you know, more working together that we need to do. So perhaps the framework acts as a bit of a conduit for some of some, some of those principles. I think underpinning this is that the range of services that NHS England commission and deliver through our providers are are set in criminal justice agency settings. So we're delivering our services um, you know, on their patch and we need to make sure that we are, we're, we're complementing um, the other processes that are in place from the criminal justice side to support these individuals. So very much a partnership approach. Yes, absolutely. Rosemary, did you have to play at that point? I think as, as Glenn already mentioned, Andrew, so we were commissioned in 2018 to develop the liaison on diversion career and competence framework. And um, a couple of years ago, um, in 2021, we were asked to develop a framework for the adult secure and detained estate and also for children and young people on a complex needs pathway. And because these are competence based roles, the new framework that we've just developed works very much alongside those. So it really helps in terms of being able to support that transferability and, and flexibility of the workforce and allows people to move from health into justice and also across the non-custodial and custodial pathway. So it just it just gives people more career opportunities, the choice uh, and really sort of promotes uh, health and justice careers. Thanks, Rosemary. So perhaps um, if I come, can come back to you, uh, Rosemary, to begin with, uh, for the benefit of our listeners who perhaps haven't had opportunity to to look at the the new framework, could you perhaps give a, give them uh, an overview of you know, the, the non custodial services and some of the current challenges that they're facing? Right. So uh, the non custodial services. Uh, Really, we, we're looking at sort of four four elements. We've talked about liaison and diversion. There's healthcare in criminal court settings. I, I think very often um, perhaps people who don't work in these settings might not realise that um, individuals who are going to court or are in court can sometimes become ill. We need to be able to provide um, care for them, healthcare in those particular settings. There's reconnect, enhanced reconnect services. So for individuals who are at the point of release, ensuring that their support out in the community when they're actually released from an institution to ensure that they get the support in terms of health and social care that they need. Talking about the four elements. So there's liaison and diversion services, which we've already um, alluded to. There's um, healthcare and criminal court settings where people who don't work in health and justice may not be aware that health um, care is provided for individuals who might be taken ill as they um, present themselves at court. There is also uh, mental health treatment requirements. So individuals who may not necessarily be given a custodial sentence, but and then custodial, uh, a community service treatment requirements around mental um, health treatment. And then uh, the final part of that um, jigsaw is the reconnect and enhanced reconnect services, which support individuals on their release from prison. Wow, quite a, a lot, a lot there, Rosemary. And I think, you, you know, it just goes when we're saying about the, the, the breadth and depth of these services and, you know, that whole range of settings that that will incorporate, you know, there's really uh, an awful lot there to unpack. Glenn, uh, I just wondered from a, from a national perspective, a national overview, if there's anything you think would be beneficial to some of our listeners to perhaps understand a little bit more. Well, I think we've already mentioned this is a pathway journey. So, you know, whether you, most people's interaction with the criminal justice system will start with their, when they meet the, uh, coming to contact with the police, uh, whether that's passing through a police custody suite or being seen by way of a voluntary attendance, voluntary interview in a community setting. And, you know, we're looking to identify vulnerable individuals and those with health problems and to address those. 
and a lot of this is sharing information with our criminal justice partners um, to get the best possible health and criminal justice outcomes, the more informed um, sort of decisions. That's what these services are essentially aimed at. Um, the Courts Healthcare Service is a new service, only recently commissioned, co-commissioned with our colleagues in the Ministry of Justice to support those uh, um, being detained in, in, in court settings. MHTRs now rolled out across 68% of the country. But this time next year, we'll have comprehensive coverage across all of the criminal courts in the country for mental health treatment requirements. And in relation to our ReConnect services, they're currently being rolled out. Again, completion date, uh, end of this financial year. So the Esenant Diversion and Courts Healthcare is already established. The other programmes um, subject to roll out, but uh, with, with clear plans to deliver by the end of the next financial year. That's great, Glenn. And uh, Michael, I suppose as somebody who's sort of working close to the coal face, as it were, maybe for the benefit of our listeners, if you could give us a, an overview of, of services and what you do on the ground, as it were. Absolutely. I think uh, going back to what Glenn said in the beginning, the, one of the key phrases here is we're an all vulnerability service. I think the common misconception is that uh, certainly even within the trust that I work, that we're a mental health service. And I think that um, to be an effective service and to meet the, such a diverse set of needs of uh, the, the clients that we work with, to, yeah, to be a, an effective service and meet the needs of the diverse client group that we that we work with, when providing such a breadth of skills and experience within that team. So as Glenn said, liaison and diversion, it's contact with all age, 10 upwards, all vulnerability within the criminal justice system. So the team that I manage uh, work within police custody and the courts, and it's about supporting those people through that journey. In some instances, it might be diverting people from the criminal justice system where that's appropriate. Uh, that's just such a range, a diverse range of needs of the 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 client group that we we'll have contact with. And I, I, I think I, I'm aware that my knowledge base of this area, you know, is is incredibly uh, limited. And having looked at the framework and uh, recognised that, you know, some of my preconceived notions about this work, what it does, what's involved is, you know, at best uh, out of date and, you know, not... Uh, as it should be. And so I think even people who are listening to this podcast who are not directly involved in these services, I, I, I really would recommend that, that they spend time uh, looking at the, the work that's been produced just to help with their own knowledge base, if nothing else, but also to then, you know, be a, um, much more aware of the work that goes on and maybe to think about what small role that they that they play in this whole whole journey. So that's that that, that that was really good there, guys. Thank you. So thinking about uh, the framework itself a little bit more uh, detail, I'd be really keen to hear from from you, uh, Rosemary, what it actually consists of. You know, perhaps in terms of its technical delivery. You know, what elements make up the framework. Thinking about those people who haven't looked at it yet and are interested in a little bit of an appraise of um, what this framework is and what it looks like. Okay, thank you, Andrew. What one of the things that the framework is trying to do here is to promote um, to individuals the the range of career opportunities that are available across the non-custodial pathway. And as you said earlier on, Andrew, that people might not just not be aware of the wide range of roles that, um, that are out there, really. So the framework itself consists of 21 competence-based job role profiles. And these roles range from uh, level two through to level eight of the skills for health career framework. And for those listeners who are quite sure what that is, the levels are based on the levels of responsibility and autonomy and accountability and supervision that are required for a particular role. So the 21 job role profiles are examples of those roles that can be found in practice against across all of those four non-custodial areas. So uh, 
just to reiterate what those are, we're talking about liaison and diversion services, and, and Michael's described a little bit about that in terms of the service that he manages. We talked also about healthcare in criminal court settings, mental health treatment requirements, and reconnect and enhanced reconnect services. So these 21 roles cover all of those roles which can be found across the non-custodial pathway. So each of those um, competence-based job roles uh, very clearly identifies and articulates the skills and knowledge that's required and the levels and areas of work across the pathway and, and all of these skills that are needed for people to be able to deliver really high quality services um, across these areas. Each role profile describes the scope of the role. So what would you expect if you're a, a mental health nurse or a paramedic working in a healthcare and criminal court setting? What are the entry requirements that, um, that are needed? And what sorts of education and training are required in order to actually support you to, to carry out your role as effectively as you can? And because the roles are competence-based, what it allows an individual to be able to do is to look at that role against their current skill set and identify any gaps in their knowledge, education or training that they might need and address those. And when I was talking earlier about the flexibility and the transferability of staff, if you know what you've got and you know what you need, you can address that skills gap. And it just means that individuals um, can enter the service as a volunteer, for example. There's a level two volunteer role in the um, L&D service. And should they decide that they want to move into a reconnect or enhanced reconnect service as a peer support worker, they can do that. So it allows that progression not only laterally, but well, not only vertically, because when we talk about career progression, I think we very often think about moving up. But actually, these competence-based roles enable people to make that vertical move as well. So I think you, you're, you're creating that transferability, uh, a bit of resilience, hopefully, because you, you know, the, you're, you're showcasing where those next potential moves are for people within those services. But it also provides some consistency because if we're all following the role profiles, I, mean, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, Rosemary, that they're not etched in tablet stone. No, they're not etched in tablets of stone and you will do this and nothing else. But what the role profiles do is provide um, a starter for 10. And because these competencies are nationally agreed standards, it does allow for that consistency because we would want someone who's receiving care in the north of the country to be receiving the same quality of care if they were in the south or east or west of the country. So, so it's, it is about consistency and helping to deliver high, high quality services. And it's also about providing an attractive career pathway for individuals um, who might not be aware, as I said, of the range of opportunities that are available. Indeed. Thanks, Rosemary. Glyn, anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I think that you know, the, the framework reflects the multidisciplinary nature of the of the work that's undertaken in supporting this cohort passing through the criminal justice system. And you know, Rose has mentioned volunteer roles, peer support roles. This is more than just the traditional nursing approach to, to, to the provision of health care for those in need. This is a sort of a supportive package of roles, and uh, so it does bring that that consistency and coherence to the way we describe you know, what we expect to see in terms of quality delivery. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Michael, anything from you? I would agree. I think, um, I mean, if you look at the team that I manage, I manage social workers, I manage learning disability nurses uh, who are working alongside mental health nurses. We've got mm. uh, peer volunteers, we've got peer support workers, as well as like uh, nursing assistants. And I think when you've got such a diverse, even if you look at one level within the framework, so you look at 
either level five or level six within the framework. There could be so many different professionals working within that within that level. What the framework does do, it, it supports with that learning. It supports identifying specific skills, specific strengths. But what it does is it allows you to protect each professional's professional identity within that. So it's, it, it's specific enough to, to offer like a guideline for a job description but it's broad enough to be able to protect people's professional identity. An example, a social worker with, that I have in the team that's got a history of working within Safeguarding has a very different skill set, very different way of working than, say, a mental health nurse that's had a history of working within acute mental health services. But what that framework will do would allow somebody, say, at level six, to meet, be able to evaluate the skills, evaluate job roles, and with, within a level, and have like quite a harmonious team, which really does meet a very diverse sort of set of needs for the people that we work with. Yep, and uh, you've used a key phrase for me, for me there, uh, uh, Michael, about enough information there for it to be meaningful, but you know, broad enough to, as well to give you flexibility, because that's. That's a key success factor. I, 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 I think there's enough flexibility in there to make it work for you and your locality and, and other localities as well. And I think also my, my, having read the documents as a former person who worked in learning and development, the fact that you've used the uh, national occupational standards means that in terms of developing any learning interventions learning programs the fact that it clearly specifies what people need to know understand what they need to be able to do um just makes makes life as someone who is then going to be responsible for creating uh, modules of learning you know i i think that's a real sort of you know supporting enabling uh, facet of the framework so what i do like about it andrew is uh the the fact that it's it's very comprehensive uh it goes uh, the links within the framework take you so like deeper and deeper within the within each section but it's very easy to navigate i think as a manager that's key uh having a having a framework that's easy to navigate uh if you're looking at one area say communication or role development you can drill right down into each area without being overwhelmed at the front page and i think you know There'll be sections of that framework that will be very important to some. There'll be others that, that perhaps it will not be as uh, important to. And you, you can go into it as deep as you want. But I like to think there's always a road out so you don't get lost sort of, you know, down in the mind, as it were. There's a, there's a, there's a way out and it all makes sense. And hopefully it all fits together. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've talked about the framework itself. It's been launched. It's out there now. Um, so I'd like us to perhaps think about what our what our hopes and expectations are of the framework, how it might be used, how you know you know how you envisage it being utilised, um, sort of you know in the real world now that it's now that it's out there. Michael, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, the framework's extremely useful uh, in sort of building job specs, supporting staff development. A good example, if we look at level six, which covers the majority of the team that I manage, is key to the framework is its independence from Agenda for Change. It's looking at skills. It's looking at the needs of the client group, the skills of the people that are working there. And it simply gets the responsibilities of, of a person working in that role. The, an example could be, if you look at one of the elements here, personal and people development, and take an area such as synthesizing new knowledge into the development of a practitioner's own practice, and I can apply this to a wide range of disciplines working within that role. It protects the inherent qualities of, of every discipline that you manage. And again, that the same area within the tool can look very different for different practitioners and their development. And it, and it supports that. But the like I say, the key is its independence from agenda for change. You know, like a, a level five role is not necessarily a band five nurse. It's not necessarily a band six nurse. 
and that's where that uh, allows I guess developers of services to be very creative to what the to what the needs of the client group are in a specific area. I think that that very much supports that. And as well, retaining accreditation within your professional group. So if uh, me as a nurse retaining my uh, revalidation, it'll be it'll be a different set of criteria to say a social worker retaining their accreditation. And I do think that that's encompassed within the framework as well. When you look at the the job specs, I think it's it's broad enough to allow people to develop in their in their profession, but stay very very much towards the needs of the service, logging in liaison and diversion. That's great. So, Michael, uh, Glenn, anything to add on from what Michael's just said? I think looking at it through a, a commissioning lens rather than a, a provider lens, I think this is a really useful resource for uh, NHS England's seven regional health and justice teams. These are the people who actually go out and commission you know, the range of non-custodial services that we've previously um, described. And um, all of our regional commissioning teams will have their eye on issues such as, you know, recruitment and the retention of staff. And I think this this product really uh, goes a long way really to, to promoting, recruiting the right people with the right knowledge, skills and experience at the right level in the right role. And also to retain and, and you know, by offering that opportunity to move upwards and along the range of services that we provide. Um, so, and it also, you know, to some extent, it assists us in our, our measure of quality. Have we got the right blend of workforce in the right place at the right time? Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Rosemary, anything to add? I think just to add there, Andrew, in, in answer to your um, question around um, how we can support the implementation of the framework. So there is a, a, a user guide which will support service managers, service managers and recruiting managers as well, to support their staff to be able to um, access and utilise the framework and describes the ways in which service managers can actually use the framework to help them with uh, personal development reviews, for example, having a look at the skill mix within their team and, and helping with recruitment and retention. Thanks, Rosemary. And I think having listened to, to, to all of your responses there, the thing that struck me is that, you know, you can look at the framework through a different different lens. You know, if you are a commissioner of services, the framework enables you to do this. It supports that work that needs to be done. It adds a degree of objectivity, consistency from a provider perspective if you're the manager of a service again it gives you that black blueprint i mean quite literally that framework to support consistent uh, high quality services through having a skilled workforce who is competent to do the things that it needs to do but to create that flexibility by thinking about how we best meet the needs of our uh, people our populations uh, and maybe that's being maybe more innovative or creative but doing it in a safe way and hopefully a, you know a, a sustainable way that we can build on and that we can replicate so the thing i'm hearing is there's a plethora of utilities for the framework and depending on where you are where you sit you know your particular view of, of the pitch there's something there for you and something to get out of the framework which i think's you know incredible for it as a as a what's out so without wishing to be too self-congratulating, um, we've talked about some of the, you know, the things are the, the hopes for the framework. But what about some of the challenges do you think we might potentially see? You know, what do we envisage, you know, some of those challenges might be around the framework's implementation and utilisation? But, you know, what could be done to overcome some uh, some of these challenges? So, um, Michael, any thoughts there? Uh, I think when we look at challenges, there might it might just be the flip side of some of the benefits. Uh, when I've said it's it's independent from agenda for change, but fundamentally in the real world, we can't unlink each role from agenda for change. 
So an example might be that um, it's an excellent tool to measure professional development and you can see somebody transitioning through the different levels, but they'll always hit that ceiling with an agenda for change. So if you've got a support worker or a peer volunteer without a professional accreditation, there's only so far that they can climb up the, up the levels within the framework. So it's always, it is always going to be linked with uh, agenda for change in, in that respect. And I think another uh, second challenge could be that different professional groups have different responsibilities placed on them per brand of agenda for change. Uh, example would be, I don't know, the remit of a band seven nurse might be a different remit to say a band eight or, or a band seven or a band eight clinical psychologist. So as a manager, you would be a band seven nurse, not necessarily so as a clinical psychologist. That's where it may look different. You might both be on level seven, but in different bands on agenda for change, which which may cause some sort of internal conflict within teams. That's great, Michael. Uh, Glenn? I think it's a lot about raising awareness and making sure that um, commissioners, providers and uh, you know, potential employees of the future have an understanding of, of the product, how it works, and that it's used consistently across the piece. What we don't want is for you know the excellent work that Rosemary has produced to, to simply sit on the shelf. It's got to be an active tool um, to assist commissioners, providers and employees if we're going to maximise the benefits from the product. No, I, I, I would just sort of echo what um, Glynn has said about getting the message out there. And, and this podcast hopefully will be one of the ways of doing that. But also, again, I think sort of Glynn alluded to um, perhaps making reference to the framework and its its use and the fact that it's it's there to help to drive up the quality of the service that's um, that's provided in these areas it is, is to make reference to it within specifications and I, I, I know that um, that there is work going on to um, ensure that that happens. Having listened to all three of you there I, I think you you know that point around the, the, the tragedy here would be this framework becomes a you know metaphorical bookend and you know just just sort of sits there not being utilised and I think things like today I think are, are good I think making it part of the wider work that, that that happens so for example making it a requirement in a commissioning spec for example and I'm sure there's lots of other ways that that could be done and I think going back to you Michael I think it, there's always that tension between people want flexibility but then they also want certainty and we're never too far away from AFC conversations but I think having worked across health and care for a number of years AFC whilst it's the thing that we talk about in the NHS for people who work in non-NHS settings it's basically just this acronym that we and so I think we have to be respectful of AFC I think it's important why job descriptions are competence based that that set out the the levels of responsibility so that when you get to some of those conversations around and i've got the scars of job matching and job evaluation over the years that we try and do things at least as fairly and consistently and objectively as possible that doesn't mean that everyone will get everything that they want all of the time but at least we can show our workings out and bring that degree of objectivity to those discussions but you know i i recognize that um they can be hard conversations to have um particularly at a local level so we're running short uh, of time so um i've just got a couple of more questions so thinking about where this framework sits in a wider context, really want to explore how we think the framework will support other elements of uh, the inclusive workforce program. Um, and I wonder, Rosemary, if you might want to kick us off with a response to that. So the inclusive workforce program set up about three years ago was established to promote the wide range of career 
opportunities and pathways that exist within health and justice commission programs. And this particular framework is part of the elements of that wider program, which was very much aimed at raising the profile of health and justice careers and really seeking to bring about a larger, more inclusive and representative workforce. The framework can be used alongside other resources that have been developed as part of the Inclusive Workforce Programme. So, for example, there's a really nice introduction to health and justice careers e-course, which provides a really nice overview of the services that are commissioned by NHS England Health and Justice and the career options that are there within the service. And all of this then helps to support the recruitment and ongoing retention of the health and justice workforce. So it's good to know that there are a number of other other resources available. And, and just before the end of the podcast, we can tell you a little bit more about where you can access those resources from. That's great, Rosemary. I'll be sure to ask you that uh, before we sign off. Glyn, anything to add to Rosemary's uh, point? The framework acts as a, a foundation, really, which underpins that, that range of products which Rosemary has just described. Um, you, we want to promote working in, in criminal justice settings in a health context as something which is, you know, which is exciting and dynamic. And, you know, those other products are there to, to support that. But uh, having this, you know, as a as a piece of work which provides those those standards which underpin all the all the range of the work that we undertake uh, should be really helpful. That's great, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, Michael, anything to add? Just that any managers at my level managing services, I would absolutely implore them to, to, to use the, uh, the framework. It's been so useful for me on a practical level, developing a workforce, creating workforces, uh, keeping the workforce motivated and high quality, high quality staff with, with skills. It's been so useful. I don't think we could ask for a better uh, endorsement of the work we've done and for the impact that it's having. And, uh, you know, I I think it's great to hear from you for somebody who's, as I said earlier on, is there sort of, you know, managing things, you know, very much at the coalface. So that's been great. Rosemary, you did say we tell our listeners how they can find out more about the framework. So this is your uh, your moment of late <laughs> health promotion. How can people find out more? Okay, so you can download a copy of the framework from the information hub section on the Skills for Health website. But also there's a really comprehensive um, inclusive workforce programme information page on the Health and Justice, NHSE Health and Justice website, where you'll not only find the framework, but um, you'll also be able to access the e-learning course and other resources um, that the Health and Justice, the National Health and Justice team have put together. So please do go and have a look. The e-course in particular is, is, is really useful, very accessible, and just provides a great overview of all those exciting things that one can do in health and justice. That's great, Rosemary, and I uh, would add my strongest of encouragement to those people listening to this podcast to uh, go away and look at all those uh, resources and to find a little time to uh, explore the real breadth, depth and quality of everything that we've produced as part of this assignment. So, Glyn, you, I think, were responsible for the commissioning of, uh, of, of this work and worked very closely with Rosemary uh, over its development. Just really interested to know um, why was Skill for Health chosen to support the development of this framework and what was it like working with Rosemary and with the wider team? Well, I think we've enjoyed a, you know, a strong and close working relationship with Skills for Health now, developing you know, several different products, the initial liaison diversion career and competency framework moving on to the secure and detained estate and children and young people. So it was a natural extension. We're delighted with the products that um, have been delivered to us, you know, created in partnership with, obviously with commissioners and providers uh, and others in the field. 
and um, you know it, it makes sense to, to to continue that that relationship and really to have continuity of approach because we want say people to follow that pathway through initial contact with the police right the way through their journey through the criminal justice system through to resettlement and working with skills of health has enabled to deliver us that that sort of seamless pathway approach. Great, thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Rosemary, for um, giving our listeners where they can access resources on the uh, Skills for Health platform. But I think it's also available, all the resources are available on the Inclusive Workforce Programme future NHS webpage. And people will be able to uh, find it there as well. So I just wanted to say thank you to um, our special guests today. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. We could talk, I'm sure, for many more sessions about this topic. We've, we've really just scratched the surface on it. But I think um, it's been uh, an interesting conversation. And um just want to thank um, our listeners to listening to this session of Love Grove on Health. But um, for now, we'll say thank you and goodbye. So all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for listening to this latest edition of Love Grove on Health. A reminder that our podcast can be found on all the major platforms, including Spotify, Amazon, Apple and Google. And that's where you can also subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also find the recordings on our Skills for Health website and social channels. Until next time, many thanks. Bye.